In this lecture, we're going to review a little bit more about integer exponents. Specifically, we're going to talk about the concept of integer exponents. Now, I've actually talked about exponents in a previous lecture, so if you want to review how the laws of exponents work, I recommend that you look through my previous lectures for the one titled Laws of Exponents. But we're going to work on the concept of negative exponents specifically here. There are just two prerequisites, really. Uh, one being the laws of exponents. You have to know what those are. So, it, like I said, you should probably view my previous video for the laws of exponents. And the second prerequisite will be that you have to know what an exponent is. And I will actually talk about both these prerequisites in this conceptual lecture. And then, in uh, after we learn those two concepts, or relearn those two concepts very briefly, we'll go ahead and introduce negative exponents. Now the definition of an exponent is really it's just repeated multiplication. And that should not be anything new to you. You've actually seen notation for repeated addition in the past. A simple example for notation for repeated addition would be something like, um, so repeated addition, just, just to kind of remind you, repeated addition. And maybe I'll just well, I'll write the whole thing out. All right. Repeated addition, if you want to write what's 3 plus 3 plus 3, a faster notation for that is what's 3 times 3. In other words, we what is 3 sets of 3 become? So that's our shorthand notation for repeated addition. Repeated multiplication also deserves its own notation. And the notation we choose is to say that that is 3, and then we put a little 5 up here, meaning that's going to be 3 multiplied by itself 5 times. So this is our notation for repeated multiplication. Oops, I backed up too far there. Here we go. And I'll go ahead and write that in here. b to the mth power is just b times b times b times b, so on and so forth, m times. Just to indicate a little couple little things here, uh, the b is called the base of the exponent. The m is called the exponent itself. Or some people call it the power. Doesn't really matter to me what it's called. And again, since this is a review, I'm not really going to spend too much time proving, actually, I'm not going to prove any of these. The proofs are done in a separate video. But recall the laws of exponents if you have uh, base b raised to the nth power and another number b raised to the nth power, that's going to be b to the m plus n. So you add exponents. It's because you have m of them in the first group and n of them in the second group, so you have m plus n of them altogether. So that'll be our first law of exponents. Our second law of exponents is if you have, well, maybe I don't need the parenthesis there, if you have b to the m over b to the n, it is equal to b to the m minus n. A little note on this one. We have to mention that b cannot be 0 because otherwise we would be dividing by 0. Let's see, any more that I can make up here? Uh, sure, I can make one up. Um, b to the m raised to the nth power is going to be b to the m times n. good way to think about this is inside the parentheses you have m of those b's multiplying and you have n groups of those. So if I have n groups of m's, that means you have n times m objects. Each of these technically has a name attached to it, but I really don't like to memorize them, so I don't bother. Uh, just as long as you know how they work. a times b to the nth power just means it's ab times ab times ab. Well, all together you have m of those a's, and you'll have m of those b's multiplying that is and there's a corollary here for fractions b over a to the nth power is equal to b to the nth power over a to the nth power and again I should probably note here that a cannot be zero it's because you're dividing by it now I didn't mention here what m and n and what b are it turns out that m and n can actually be any numbers you want. So it's it's not um, a requirement that they be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They can be negative. And so we'll talk about that right now. Turns out that b to the negative nth power is defined to be 1 over b to the nth power. Oops, 
That's supposed to be an n. 1 over b to the nth power. Also, b, well, maybe I should write it this way, 1 over b to the negative n is equal to b to the n over 1, or in other words, just b to the n. Okay, there actually is one more, so let me write also. a over b raised to the negative n is equal to b over a raised to the positive n. So let's talk about what's happening here. If I have a negative exponent, this is how I've always thought about it, you can essentially rip off the negative off the exponent, and your base and power will drop to the opposite position here. It's in the numerator. When I rip off the negative, it drops down. The base and the exponent drop down to the denominator. And again, the exponent's now positive. Along the same lines, if I start with 1 over b to the negative n, again, I can rip the negative off the power. And the base and the exponent will swap positions. They'll go upstairs into the numerator. And finally, if you have a fraction raised to the negative power, you can rip off the negative power, and inside that parentheses there, the numerators and denominators swap. Because this is called a conceptual lecture, I should probably convince you as to why this is true. So here's some a little bit of convincing here. If you take something like, oh, I don't know, x to the 7th, and divide it by x to the third. Now according to the law of exponents, or one of the many laws of exponents, that should equal x to the top power minus bottom power, which would be x to the fourth, right? Now this is not actually how I teach this. I generally just look at this and say, listen, do they have the same bases? Oh yeah, they sure do. Well, if two objects have the same base, and they're in a fraction, I then ask, who has more power and by how much? Well, the top has more power by 4. So the answer will be x to the fourth on top. Along the same lines, I could have asked you, what's x to the uh, seventh divided by x to the tenth? Well, who has more power, top or bottom? The bottom has more power, and I'm going to just write this over here. So the bottom has more power, so that's where the x is going to remain. By how much? Well, by 3. If you look at this, this would be 7x's multiplying on top, and there would be 10x's multiplying on bottom, and if you canceled them out, you'd have 3 left over. In fact, I'll show you that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 on top, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 on the bottom. And then you can see, oh, well, this x cancels this one, this one here and you can go down the line right and what you'll see is that in the end you have x times x times x in the bottom and just one on top so this idea of how many is left over and where is a great way to think about it but now again this is going to be conceptual so I want you to understand why these theorems are all true so let's go ahead and do it in this case if I look at x to the 7th over x to the 10th, if I follow the rule, one of the law of exponents, that should be x to the 7 minus 10, top minus bottom, bottom power, which would be x to the negative 3. But wait a second, I just told you that this x to the 7th over x to the 10th is equal to 1 over x cubed. Oh, so wait a second. That means that x to the negative third is equal to 1 over x cubed. So that kind of convinces you right there that it's true. Uh, hopefully it convinces you that it's true. Now that's not a proof, but it's a great motivation as to seeing why this, oh, if I have a negative exponent, I can rip it off and it falls downstairs. And I want you to try to convince yourself as to why that's true. So that that convinces, hopefully, the first one. Let's try to convince you of the second one here. So I'm going to open up a new page. I'm just writing a reminder to myself that I want to show you that 1 over b to the negative nth power 
is equal to b to the nth power. And I'm going to I'm not going to do this through a proof. I'm just going to do this through an example. So let's take an example of 1 over some variable raised to the negative 10th power, let's say. Now, I've already told you, first of all, I'll write this as 1 divided by x to the negative 10th power. I've already told you that x to the negative 10th power, if we look back at our, um, our theorem here, we already know that x to the negative 10th power is going to be 1 over x to the 10th power. So we should be okay with that. So let me go ahead and write that down that x to the negative tenth should be 1 over x to the tenth. So I have 1 divided by 1 over x to the tenth. Well, I can change that division into a multiplication if I flip the back fraction. I'll be x to the tenth. Oh, wait a second. So 1 over x to the negative tenth is equal to, through a chain of equalities, is equal to x to the positive tenth. And that is the justification as to why this theorem is true. The last theorem is goes the same way. The last theorem, remember, was this one, um, where we had a over b to the negative nth power. I wrote m again. I always have a hard time. I always write m's. It doesn't really matter, I suppose. But I said that we could rewrite that by taking the reciprocal of the fraction inside the parentheses, and then ripping the negative off the power. Why is this true? Well, I happen to know that a over b to negative nth power is, by our previous theorem, 1 over a over b to the nth power. Well, let's see here how this works. That's going to equal 1 divided by a over b to the nth power. Now, I'm going to slightly change this a little bit. I'm going to say that's 1 divided by a to the nth over b to the nth, because we have a theorem that says we can do that, and then change that division to multiplication by flick, flipping the back end. So it's b to the nth over a to the nth. And 1 times anything is just that object, so that's just b to the nth over a to the nth. And finally, that's just going to be b over a the nth power. So again, through a chain of equalities, I've shown you that a over b to the negative nth is just equal to b over a to the positive nth power. Now, do you need to memorize all these? No, these are just the concepts of why these are all true. But there is one thing that's really neat um, that a lot of people do not believe. So let me show you this kind of next neat little thing. Any number to the zeroth power or any variable to the zeroth power is equal to 1 as long as our number or variable is not 0. So in other words, like 4 to the zeroth is just defined to be 1. It's not technically defined to be, it's, it's actually easy to show that this is true using some of our theorems. So, and I have, this is by the way, a common question I'll get from students. So if you ever wonder, why is it true that b to the zeroth is equal to 1? Why is that just something that somebody came along and said that should be true? It's because of the following reason. Suppose that you had b to the mth power over b to the mth power. First of all, you should be able to easily see that the b to the mths will cancel, and that should turn into the number 1, right? b to the mth over b to the mth is 1. They cancel out nicely. But you could have also used a law of exponents to say, well, that's b to the top power minus bottom power. And m minus m is just 0. And then you realize, wait a second, this is a chain of equalities. 1 is equal to this picture, which is equal to this picture, which is equal to b to the 0th. That is, 1 is actually equal to b to the 0th. And the only thing we can't let b become is 0 because we're dividing by it, so it can't be 0. So these are all the concepts that will be used when you use integer exponents. These theorems, the laws of exponents, the fact that anything to the 0th power that's non 0 is, turns into 1, and also these negative exponent theorems here. These are very important to remember. In the next video, we'll actually use them.